So we're taught at school that um, fertilisation is a process that involves one egg and one sperm. That's kind of the traditional way that we learn about it. But that's not always the case with birds. Um, can you tell me um, a little bit about how fertilisation works with birds? Yeah, so you're right, that is what we typically learn um, in school. Um, and actually, that, it, that is kind of right um, for all animals, including birds, because the actual process of fertilisation, so the fusion of the male DNA from the sperm mm -hmm. with the female DNA from the egg, is really a one-on-one -on -one affair. Okay. Um, however, the events leading up to that uh, the actual process of fertilisation can vary quite a lot between different animal groups. So um, if we just take humans, for example, because that's what we're kind of familiar with, um, in the case of humans and other mammals, um, one sperm penetrates the egg and then very quickly the egg forms a block to all the mm -hmm. other sperm. Um, and this is really important because in mammals, if more than one sperm enters the egg, and we call that process polyspermy, um, then this is really quite destructive to the egg, it can cause abnormal development of the embryo and uh, ultimately lead to the embryo dying at a very, very early stage. Mm -hmm. But in birds, uh, in contrast to mammals, tens, hundreds, even thousands of sperm can penetrate the egg. Oh, wow. You still only get one of them fusing with the female genetic material, but there are several others right there in the vicinity of, mm -hmm. of the female pronucleus, all kind of right next to the action. Um, and we've kind of known this for, surprisingly, over a century. So even in the 1900s, a guy called Eugene Harper had seen all this stuff going on in a pigeon's egg, but no one had asked kind of what's going on with these extra sperm. Do they have any role to play in fertilization or embryo development? Um, and so this is kind of was kind of the big kind of unanswered question. So what what does happen if only one sperm penetrates the ovum of a of a bird? Well our research has shown that in birds kind of cut completely the opposite to mammals, one sperm really isn't enough. So if one sperm penetrates, it may well make its way to uh, the germinal disc where the female pronucleus is, and it may well fuse with the female pronucleus, so mm -hmm. fertilisation can take place, but actually um, that then that fertilised egg is very, very unlikely to develop beyond the very earliest stages of embryo development. So our experiments have shown that actually, in order for normal embryo development to proceed, you actually need multiple sperm penetrating um, the uh, egg of, of a bird. Okay. Um, and your experiments, you, you just mentioned, um, are kind of investigating this and looking at... Um, the difference between uh, sperm depleted males and and uh, kind of a control group. Um, so can you just talk me through exactly what you did in your experiments? Yeah, so we actually looked at this in two very different um, bird species. So we looked at it in a, a little passerine bird called the zebra finch, which is really tiny, it actually lays eggs, which are just wow. this big. Um, <laughs> Absolutely <laughs> tiny. <laughs> and then the other species that we, um, we looked at was uh, the domestic chicken, which um, okay. I'm sure you're familiar yeah. with. Um, and actually, uh, we started off with the zebra finch and we kind of started this study a little bit by accident to be honest oh, really? because um, what we were trying to do was um, establish a, a protocol for doing artificial insemination in zebra finches mm -hmm. but as I said they're so tiny yeah. that actually it was really difficult and it pretty much it didn't really work. Okay. Um, so what we found is when we artificial, tried to artificially uh, inseminate zebra finches um, almost no sperm made it to the egg. Often okay. no sperm did make it. If they did make it, they were in very tiny numbers, like just less than five, sometimes even just one. Yeah. And um, so by accident, we'd kind of found this way of severely limiting sperm numbers reaching the egg in zebra finches. We still don't know exactly why mm -hmm. um, that was the case, but uh, nonetheless, we kind of had this method. So we decided to look at, um, compare whether uh, females that had very few sperm reaching the egg, whether there was any differences in terms of their fertilisation success mm -hmm. and embryo survival compared with uh, what we called a control group, but what was actually females that had, had natural uh, copulations with males. 
Of course, this wasn't the ideal comparison because there's lots of other things that could differ between yeah. artificial insemination and natural insemination. So we actually then decided, OK, we actually need to try and do this properly with a real, real controlled experiment. Mm -hmm. So we repeated the whole thing on domestic chickens okay. um, in which uh, artificial insemination is well established. So mm -hmm. we could do a very low sperm dose and a very high sperm dose, both artificially. And what did you find um, was the difference between the two groups in terms of fertilisation success and embryo survival? Um, so in terms of fertilisation success, there actually wasn't a great deal of difference oh, and okay. that was quite surprising. Yeah, so, such a big difference in sperm numbers. Yeah, exactly. So in the zebra finch, uh, whether eggs were um, penetrated by one sperm or say 50 sperm, there really wasn't any difference. They were just as likely to be fertilised. Okay. Um, in the chickens, uh, there was a 20% reduction in fertilisation success in the sperm limited group. Okay. Um, uh, so a kind of quite a decrease, but a small decrease. Mm -hmm. um, but funny enough, there was quite a strong pattern there. So basically those eggs that weren't fertilised had all been penetrated by fewer than three sperm. Okay. Whereas the ones that had had all been uh, penetrated by three or more sperm. Um, so it does look like there's some kind of threshold effect mm. there. We'd have to do a bit more work to be able to actually say that three is kind of the magic number of sperm mm -hmm. for chickens, but it does suggest that there might be kind of a threshold number. Yeah. Um, in terms of embryo survival, though, there was a real uh, striking difference. Mm -hmm. So only... 11% um, of the embryos that were produced um, under sperm limitation in the zebra finches um, actually uh, developed to hatch. And so in real numbers, that's just three out of 27 embryos. Oh, that doesn't sound like much. No, exactly. And it was even, uh, the effect was even stronger in the chicken. So um, 10 embryos were produced under sperm limitation, but mm -hmm. none of them hatched. Um, in fact, none of them even survived beyond 48 hours uh, of development. Um, so they're really does seem to be a real strong effect of the number of sperm penetrating on um, subsequent embryo development and survival. That's really interesting. Yeah. Um, so in terms of the number of sperm actually reaching the egg, it seems that actually the number that the, the female was inseminated with don't make such a big difference. So proportionally, there's quite an interesting uh, balance there. What exactly was it that you found? With yeah, that? so this was really a really, I think, quite cool and interesting, um, quite unexpected finding mm. um, of our study. When we were trying to reduce the number of sperm inseminated in order to kind of adjust the number that were going to reach the egg, mm -hmm. we actually found that we had to inseminate far fewer sperm than we expected. Yeah. So sort of based on our control, we thought, okay, if we reduce it by this much, then we should end up with this many sperm. But actually, as we reduced the number inseminated, the number that ended up reaching the egg was actually, the proportion was actually increasing. So right. it's, it's kind of strange. What, it, what we think is happening is that females are basically kind of regulating the number, the proportion of sperm that make it through based mm -hmm. on kind of how many sperm they have available. Um, so it's basically quite like an efficient use. If you're sperm limited, mm -hmm. um, you can actually use sperm more efficiently in order to make sure that you get enough uh, sperm to the site of fertilisation. And to be honest, I guess it kind of makes sense in a way that females um, should be able to do this because if they are in a situation where they're sperm limited, um, you would kind of want to avoid the risk of yeah. infertility. But actually, um, it's kind of generally not been kind of widely acknowledged or accepted that females might have this degree of control over um, the events during um, fertilisation. So this yeah. is kind of quite a cool result. Yeah, it's really cool. Yeah. Um, what circumstances might that be useful in the wild for birds? Well, actually, there's quite a lot of circumstances um, that it might be useful. So um, 
the, the processes of copulation mm -hmm. and ovulation are rarely kind of in sync in birds. Okay. So copulation might occur a number of days before the eggs ovulated, mm -hmm. um, and actually it could be even it could be even longer. And if you think about it, um, for birds, for female birds that have to lay, for example, a large clutch of eggs, they might really want to hold on to their sperm and strategically allocate um, sperm across subsequent eggs in a clutch. Yeah, but that intensifies um, if you take for example species um, where they might have really limited um, opportunities to copulate um, so for example pelagic seabirds spend most of their time out at sea foraging before the egg laying period yeah. and they so they have very infrequent copulations and um, these often occur quite a long time before the eggs laid so it makes sense that the female might again want to kind of hold on to them and just release them when when she kind of needs to so they can store them and wait until they're ready to use them yeah exactly so this this is a really interesting um a bit of kind of avian reproductive physiology mm -hmm. birds have got specialized storage sites oh, that, really? yeah that the sperm go into okay. and they can be stored for days weeks in some species even months wow. um, so a lot of these pelagic seabirds can store sperm for for a couple of months and then still use them afterwards to fertilize eggs that's incredible yeah and um, another another kind of example of when um, females might end up sperm limited is um so this might seem a bit surprising but in lekin species where the males are kind of all just Display in to attract the females, yeah. and um, and the the females are kind of going around and mating with basically who they choose is best. Mm -hmm. Usually, it's only one or a small handful of males that kind of monopolise all the matings. Because they're mating so frequently, they actually the males actually end up sperm depleted. Right. Um, so the female may mate with a male who actually hasn't got very much sperm to transfer, yeah. and she may end up sperm limited herself. So um, even in a quite promiscuous yeah. um, a situation, you could still end up with a, a female being sperm limited. Yeah, so in those cases she wants to make sure that the sperm that she does get, get to the egg. Exactly, yeah. Oh, interesting. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Thanks very much. <laughs>